Welcome to the Kaiser Report. I am Max Kaiser. You know, recently the Prime Minister here in the UK, David Cameron, claimed that profits were not a dirty word. I have news for you, Dave. Profit isn't even a word. Not with any objective meaning, anyway. Thanks to accounting fraud, it's whatever some schmata with a bean counter wants it to be. And so, so you do have all these units of accounting fraud. Let's call them profits. Then what, Stacy? Exactly, Max, because we hear all the time, profits are up, profits are down, profits are up, profits are down. And nothing ever seems to change in the real economy. This first headline here, the profits profit. Profits have been booming in America, reaching the highest proportion of GDP since the Second World War. Given such buoyant conditions, you might imagine that businesses are investing like crazy to take advantage of all those great opportunities, correct? No, they're not, Max, because instead businesses are handing cash back to shareholders, a tactic once reserved for executives who had run out of ideas. In 2011, the value of American share buybacks was equal to 2.7% of GDP. In Britain, the figure was 3.1%. Well, yeah, you bring up a couple of points there. They the important point here is that when the corporations report on their profits, that is a number that is delivered to them by one of the big four accounting agencies to report as their profit. But what we've discovered is that these big four accounting agencies, like the banks on Wall Street, like the hedge funds, like the rating agencies, are also committing massive fraud. And they simply cook the books on uh, the mandate of the CEO who wants to report numbers that they feel are the best in terms of how to affect stock price, et cetera. Uh, Jack Welch at General Electric very famously was a book cooker every single quarter. They reported this uh, earnings number that was cooked by whoever their accountant was at the time. And of course, you only have big four, of the, big four left of the accounting agencies. There used to be the big seven and the big eight, et cetera, but they've all been uh, systematically uh, closed down for accounting fraud. Now we've got four left. They're all involved in accounting fraud, and I'm sure that pretty soon there'll be only three left. Well, the article in The Economist is looking at a new book, and it's called The Road to Recovery, How and Why Economic Policy Must Change. It's by Andrew Smithers, an economist. And he notes that in the early 1970s, American companies invested 15 times as much cash as they distributed to shareholders. In recent years, the ratio has dropped back to below two. Look at this chart, cash out. The ratio of cash spent on investment versus cash distributed to shareholders, and that's declined. And yes, he, he points out that there are two major reasons. One of them is that executives are paid in bonuses now, by and large, rather than in salaries. So their incentive is to use the cash on the books of the company to invest in their own Christmas bonus, rather than in the future of the nation, the economy, or the population. They're not reinvesting in the company itself. They're extracting the equity along with all the shareholders. Right. Well, it used to be that corporations would boost their stock price by increasing what they do for the business of the corporation. They would make more cars, or they would deliver some kind of enhanced services, or drill more, or mine more. But since the invention of derivatives, the modern derivatives market starting really in the 1980s and then all the deregulation that went on at the same time, corporations now mostly make money by uh, financialization and by trading and by arbitrage and by currency uh, manipulation and market manipulation and accounting manipulation. So in other words, most of the corporations' profits are derived from accounting manipulation and financialization and arbitrage and other related uh, kind of uh, paper profits, but the actual underlying uh, activity of the corporation is no longer what drives the growth of that corporation. The profits all come from rigging the system, and that's exactly what that statistic shows, is that cash is being paid back to shareholders on top of the cash that they are gaming from the sys gaming the system, but they're not actually engaging in expending money on their businesses to improve the work, get more work, create more jobs, do more productivity, et cetera. As the headline of this book points out, it's about economic policy. So David Cameron should be worried not so much about profits. He shouldn't care about that. That's not his role. His role is economic policy and governing that. And whereas here buybacks tend to boost earnings per share, investment decreases earnings per share. So he should find a way for them to invest in the economy because he shouldn't care how much they're bringing home for a Christmas bonus. He should care about the future of the nation, of the economy of the nation and the world. Well, in the case of, let's say, Amazon, the uh, retailer, 
they are investing in their own company. Jeff Bezos, very smart guy, mm. uh, their stock prices gets knocked down occasionally because he has invested in the infrastructure of his company. Uh, he invests in the company really more than what he just trying to appease the Wall Street analysts. However, uh, at the same time, uh, he is not paying anywhere near the taxes that he should be paying in the UK. So he's gaming the system on the financial end as well. But David Cameron, in other words, is wrong on both scores. Number one, he's wrong not to force Amazon to pay taxes. And number two, he's wrong to equate profits uh, divorced of any an analysis of where those profits come from as uh, universally being good. Uh, you have to, you know, he just speaks in sound bites that have, especially, he's, he's economically illiterate, essentially, is what we're talking about. And so he, the, the nation as a whole then becomes economically illiterate when the prime minister is a complete jackass when it comes to describing how corporations report their earnings and profits. So you brought up remuneration, how the, the payment for the CEOs and the senior executives are tied to the share price. Now, the, in particular, they also talk about share options. And I know you were a big options trader, so this will be your sort of special topic here. Many executives are rewarded in the form of share options for meeting targets. Options are more valuable when they are linked to a volatile asset. The more the asset price moves, the more likely it is the option will be exercised. Since share prices are affected by trends and profits, executives have an incentive to pursue strategies that make profits more volatile. And indeed, until 2000, profits in the national accounts data had very similar volatility to the reported profits of S&P 500 companies. Since then, the latter have been four times as volatile. Yeah, Microsoft's a great example of somebody who's gaming the options market to boost their uh, bonus payments and to uh, massage errors on their balance sheet and income statements as well. But basically what they're saying here is that we are familiar with the idea that executives are paid stock options instead of cash. And those stock options go up in value if the stock price goes up in value. And the stock price can go up in value if one of the big four accounting agencies reports a phony earnings for the quarter that boosts the stock price, thus the option price, and then the executive cashes in those options. What you're saying here is a new twist to a game, which is that volatility in the options market affects how options are priced. And if you can get your accounting firm to come in with lower earnings than you're actually reporting in one quarter and then crash the stock, but then get your options priced at that level and then have the following quarter have your accounting firm massage the books to report earnings beyond than what you're actually making, and you can boost the options price when you cash them out. So you've got the accounting firms, the options trader, and the CEO and the executives all colluding to game the system to extract wealth. We saw, by the way, Apple Computer after 9-11, when their stock crashed, they then jumped into the market to price options based on the post 9-11 crash low. Uh, those executives then cashed out based on the 9-11 tragedy. So they monetized the 9-11 tragedy, the Apple executives, and we see that across the board, the Fortune 500 companies gaming the system, uh, exploiting tragedy when they can, and turning what everyone else thinks is, oh my God, 9-11, what a tragedy. There's Apple like, ha, 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 let's make money on this tragedy. It's disgraceful. Also, they point to the fact that all these changes came about because driven by mark-to-market -market accounting. Firms mark up the value of their assets during good times and then write them down on the bad. There is no equivalent to this in the national accounts. In Mr. Smithers' view, that means American profits are overstated, particularly at the moment. Indeed, according to the national accounts, American companies have been paying out in cash more than 100% of their domestic profits to shareholders. There's a twofold problem here. So number one is that these companies in America have not actually deleveraged the hype. The mainstream media tells you that all this deleveraging has been done. The economy is on its way to recovery. The other thing is because if there actually are not so deleveraged, we could be on the verge of another crisis, an economic and financial crisis. Well, yeah, what we're saying there is that the asset prices down the books of these corporations, and in particular the banks, by the way, mm. are which they use both as collateral to finance more lending, more loans, more capital for themselves, as well as uh, engaging in mergers and acquisitions where they're buying other companies, is overstated substantially. Uh, and so uh, if you have any kind of mark-to-market, -market, if you have any kind of rationalization where they say, particularly in the case of banks, that the bonds on their balance sheets are not worth 100 cents on the dollar, they're worth actually 10 
cents on the dollar. Then you have a repeat of what we saw in 2008. Or the massive undertow of deflation, which is being masked by accounting fraud and money printing, is revealed to show that the economy and the corporate nations that make up the economy are vastly overstating their net worth and income. And so you have a, a huge um, you know, crash. So speaking of accounting firms, many of the accounting firms are now morphing into consulting firms. And this is in our final quick headline here. Mass IT project is latest black eye for Deloitte. This is a Massachusetts and an internet technology project. In its brochure, Deloitte Consulting proclaims a record of smooth implementations of complex technology projects. But in courts, school systems and government agencies in several states, the rollout of computer systems built by the global consulting firm has proved to be anything but smooth. So they said from California to Florida to Pennsylvania to Massachusetts, time after time, all of their programs are coming in way over budget or actually not even delivering anything that's actually even usable. All right. Well, the accounting firms are splitting themselves into two. So instead of having a full-service accounting firm like Arthur Anderson involved in the Enron scandal, where they had to go after and say, well, your accounting business of what you do was committing fraud, so we're going to have to shut you down, they, they outsource the fraud to a consulting firm of which they have an intimate relationship with. And then they have the consulting firm commit all the fraud, but this, the effect is the same. Uh, for Deloitte and KPMG and Arthur Anderson and the whole group of them commit this massive fraud as part of a conspiracy uh, colluding with the uh, rating agencies and the banks. So they go into one in particular case for Deloitte, and this is in Florida's Miami-Dade County. School officials fired Deloitte in 2009 partway through an $84 million contract to overhaul the district's computer system. After paying Deloitte $30 million and having virtually nothing usable they could rescue, Superintendent Albert Carvaro fired them. He said, after much review, the best thing to do was terminate Deloitte, and we did with a vengeance. We cut out the middleman. This is the thing, is that this is the toll booth economy, these middlemen who are the, the sort that practice these profits that David Cameron seeks. Right. Whether it's Deloitte or Apple or HSBC, they profit from terrorism, money laundering, and uh, all kinds of social... Um, uh, mishap. All right, <laughs> Stacey Herbert, thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. Stay tuned for the second half, a whole lot more. <music> Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to go to Chicago and speak with Francine McKenna of readtheauditors.com. Francine, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Hello, thanks for having me. All right, Francine McKenna, the big four audit firms are morphing into the big four consulting firms. Tell us about why this is happening and if it matters. Well, it's happening in spite of the fact that Sarbanes-Oxley was supposed to stop all that. If you remember, when Sarbanes-Oxley was put in, at, in force in 2002 after the Enron failure and Arthur Anderson's involvement in the Enron failure, they said, never again will you have an audit firm that was conflicted, that was doing too much work for their clients, such that they lost sight of their responsibility for audit. But in the 10 plus years that we've had since then, nobody's enforcing those rules. Nobody's enforcing those restrictions. And so the firms have gone uh, right back to where they started and actually probably even better. Deloitte never stopped. The other three firms had to rebuild after selling their consulting firms and waiting for their non-competes to, uh, to expire. Yeah, we mentioned this in the first half of the show, citing the example of Enron and Arthur Anderson. So here you had an accounting firm that was wrapped up in massive fraud. Uh, there was uh, some kind of action in uh, Sarbanes-Oxley. And then uh, you've got Deloitte just ignoring this completely. They are separating their businesses to avoid complying with any kind of reasonable standard of accounting. And also, it should be noted that the traders that were involved in market manipulation for Enron simply went to other trading firms, including JP Morgan, and started doing the exact same false trading of energy contracts as well. So absolutely nothing was done to stop that enormous massive fraud in the American economy. But uh, in the case of these consulting firms, I said in the first half, I want to get your thoughts on this. Basically, the idea is just to outsource the fraud to the consulting firm because the consulting <laughs> firm doesn't fall under the same regulatory framework, correct? 
they're really in sort of a limbo. Um, I've talked to the SEC, I've talked to the PCOB, the new audit regulator, and said who really looks at whether or not the consulting firm is conflicted or has independence restrictions, in particular if they're working on something that relates to their prior audit work. For example, Deloitte was the uh, reviewer at JP Morgan for the foreclosure reviews. Lo and behold, the work that they were really looking at related to Bear Stearns and Washington Mutual, their former audit clients. So they're sitting there reviewing these mortgages, reviewing these transactions to see if any of the customers have been defrauded, and yet they're being sued by the shareholders of Bear Stearns and Washington Mutual for their failure to audit those uh, transactions while they were at Bear Stearns or Washington Mutual. It really was a farce, and nobody seemed to think that it was their responsibility to look at Deloitte's role as a consultant. Really, the only one who has standing to sue is the client itself, and J.P. Morgan was not going to be suing them. I was sort of uh, heartened, though, by this uh, situation in the U.K. with M.G. Rover, where Deloitte did get um, slammed and fined, uh, pretty significantly such that they're even appealing it. They were the auditor of MG Rover before they failed, and before they failed, they started helping um, the executives uh, take uh, as much money out as possible, loot the company through various compensation schemes. And those executives were slammed, but more importantly, Deloitte was slammed for the conflict of interest in not managing their public duty um, where you ended up with uh, others paying for those mistakes. All right, let's talk about uh, Deloitte & Touche. It's the largest of the big four. Deloitte's been handed dozens of huge IT contracts for state and local governments. Um, so how and why do these contracts go so wrong? Well, Deloitte was the only firm of the big four that didn't sell their consulting arm after Sarbanes-Oxley was enacted. The other three firms saw this coming and said, maybe we won't be able to do consulting work, in particular to our audit clients. Let's get out of this. Let's focus on audit. And they did that for a little while, but Deloitte never, never uh, sold their consulting arm. They kept going, and their primary focus is federal services, state and local government contracts. So they do that all over the world. They do a lot of work for the U.S. De Defense Department and other sovereign governments. But here in the United States, they do a lot of work for state and local governments. They're still one of the firms that builds custom applications for things like retirement systems and pension systems and unemployment systems. And they're getting in trouble all over the United States. In fact, the Boston Globe has had a series of stories about two contracts, one where Deloitte was fired and one where they'd love to have fired them because they sunk millions and millions and millions of taxpayer dollars in with a system that failed. And it's happened in other places like Marin County, like Los Angeles School District, and now some cases in Florida, where they're worried that these systems are just money holes and Deloitte uh, doesn't really take the same responsibility as they should as an audit firm. People are basically confused. Who is Deloitte? Is it an audit firm, a consulting firm? Are they a consulting firm with a little bit of audit, audit firm with a little bit of consulting? Frankly, consulting is growing in all the firms much, much faster, double digits compared to single digits or uh, not even growing at all in the, in the rest of the firms. All right, now, Deloitte and Touche has just settled three lawsuits over its audits of Taylor Bean and Whitaker Mortgage Corporation, a lender whose 2009 collapse helped spark one of the biggest bank failures during the financial crisis. Tell us more about this case. Well, this case has been going on since, and this is an interesting case because it's wrapped up with another failure, Colonial Bank, which PwC is being sued for by the FDIC. So you had uh, Lee Farkas at Taylor Bean and Whitaker, uh, which was uh, perpetrated a fraud. Certain executives have already gone to jail. Certain executives went to jail with Colonial Bank, who is enabling the fraud at Taylor Bean and Whitaker. And the auditors have been sued. PwC is still... Um, um, fighting that lawsuit. They might hopefully go to trial. I really thought that Deloitte was going to go to trial on this one. It was due to go to trial in a couple of weeks in Miami, and it got settled confidentially, maybe for a lot of money, but certainly not at the level that it would take to take Deloitte down. So some estimates have been made. What would it take for another big four firm to go under, like Anderson did? Anderson went under because it was a criminal indictment by the U.S. Justice Department. That will never happen again. They know that mistake. 
They decided not to make that mistake when KPMG was accused of tax shelter fraud, and they did not um, indict KPMG criminally for that. K KPMG survived and thrived. So that will never happen. But what might happen is a big giant lawsuit from a private party or from some country outside the U.S. that doesn't want to follow the U.S. rules. Taylor Bean and Whitaker was that lawsuit. It was a $7 billion claim. Um, they had overcome all motions to dismiss. It was set to go to trial, and it settled. I'm very sad about that because the only way we're going to know what really goes on, the, where the public is going to see what a farce the audit has become, is for one of these cases to go to trial and the firms and their partners to open their big mouth and say something stupid. That's what happens when they go to trial. Um, there was a case in Australia, Centro, where the um, PwC went to trial, the auditor, audit partner went to trial, and the case settled in the middle of the trial because the firm and the partner started saying stuff that was really stupid, like blaming the low-level staff, and the firm blamed the partner and said because he signed the audit, it was his fault, not the firm's fault. So that's why they don't go to trial in the U.S. They know that they're going to say something stupid. They know that we're going to see how the sausage is made, and they settle. Fortunately for Deloitte, they survived. It's probably less than a billion dollar settlement. Right, well you mentioned the collusion with J.P. Morgan uh, in accounting fraud, and uh, in the case of Deloitte, uh, of course, uh, they can simply pay a small fine and then lobby Congress and lawmakers to change the laws so that they can commit the same fraud over and over and over again, but not get caught. This is a pattern we've seen on Wall Street for decades. People don't understand this is also the same pattern with the big four accounting firms. They're caught breaking the law, committing fraud, they pay a small fine, and then they lobby to have the laws change to allow them to commit these frauds without being fined or penalized. Now, the CEO of Taylor Bean was sentenced to 30 years in prison for covering up funding shortfall by pledging ownership in thousands of the same mortgage loans to multiple investors. Now, Francine, in the UK, that's completely legal. It's called rehypothecation, <laughs> right? So why, why pick on this guy, Taylor Bean, when this is really the de facto business model for the entire city of London? Well, you always end up with something uh, to deal with when the firm fails. So in that case, Taylor Bean and Whitaker went bankrupt. Colonial Bank uh, failed, was taken over by the FDIC. And one of the nice things is that when there's a failure, there's a bankruptcy examiner report. And we've seen over and over, the other case was New Century, which was a KPMG audit client early in the, early in the crisis in 2007. When those firms fail, Lehman is a good, another good example. There's a bankruptcy examiner report that lays out very, very clearly what happened. They get investigative powers that are much more difficult if you're trying to do it through court. And even with those breadcrumbs, that, that very simple trail that points to culpability, like the Lehman bankruptcy examiner report pointed to culpability of the executives and of Ernst & Young, the audit firm, prosecutors, uh, the SEC, the Department of Justice, they're reluctant to take the firms down because they're so embedded in the operation of the government. Deloitte, who we've been talking about, also audits the Fed, also audits BlackRock and Blackstone, integral parts of, uh, of what the, the federal government in the U.S. had to do to try to recover um, buying assets for, uh, from, uh, during, in the, during, after the crisis in the TARP program and in other programs to try to recover from the crisis. So they need these audit firms because they're working for the government while they're working for private companies and they're working all over the world and they're part of this network and they play Switzerland and they're protected by the government from prosecution. Right, so just to reiterate here that what they've got the CEO Taylor Bean on of repledging the same securities uh, is done by HSBC, Barclays, Lloyds, and RBS every single day in the city of London. They call it rehypothecation, but it's just fraud. Mm -hmm. Now, finally, uh, Francine, what's the latest on all the dodgy accounting at JP Morgan's London Whale and now its $11 billion mortgage backed securities fraud charges? That settlement uh, with the SEC, talk about a farce. They wanted so much to portray that as a Sarbanes-Oxley win, and they didn't use any Sarbanes-Oxley uh, legislation in order to go after either the executives individually, the audit firm, or anybody else that was involved. Again, J.P. Morgan paid a fine, like they'll do in this settlement that they're talking about now. It may seem like a big number to us, but it's just a cost of doing business, and they'll keep going on. Uh, it seems to me that of all the frauds, the rating agencies, the banks, the fund managers, 
the hedge funds. The glue that keeps them all together are these big four accounting firms. They're really at the nexus of this global fraud wave. Your thoughts? Really, they're supposed to be the guardians of the shareholders and of the capital markets, and instead they're bl playing both sides. And the one that's losing is the shareholders, taxpayers now who have to pay for the bailouts when these firms fail, and the firms are giving us no warning that they're even uh, nearing insolvency or, or illiquidity. It's terrible, and unfortunately, they're, they're the ones that are sitting in the middle of uh, the whole thing, playing Switzerland and playing both sides of the fence and collecting billions and billions of dollars um, as they're doing it. All right, Francie McKenna, we'll have to leave it there. Thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you. And that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest, Francine McKenna of RE, theauditors.com. If you'd like to get in touch, please tweet us at Kaiser Report. Until next time, bye, y'all.